So Jeremy, it's great to have you. For those who are interested, uh, Jeremy will tell you where he is. I am sitting in Zurich in my office. Jeremy, why don't you tell the listener where you are right now and where you've come from? Hey, Guy. I am in a 12th century castle in Austria called Feistritz, and uh, it's owned by the family of a, of a friend of mine, and his sister is a celloist, and she every year hosts a concert called Harriet and Friends um, for interested people in the area to come and listen to some wonderful music. So Lily and I are here uh, for four days, and it's been it's been relaxing, but it's a very beautiful castle. Um, it is it has a lot of historical significance, um, and there's a book um, that mentions the castle about the history of this area, um, and it's called Enemy at the Gate, um, about the time when the Turks were trying to invade this part of Austria, and the castle played a role in that and defending the area. So um, very well preserved and happy to be here. And Jeremy, I hear an American accent. I wouldn't presume to tell people what accent they speak with, but perhaps uh, you know, I know that you hail from San Diego. Yes. Maybe you can just give tell us how somebody who was born in San Diego ends up in a castle in Austria. Yeah, I live in Amsterdam, and I moved to Amsterdam a little over three years ago. March 27th uh, was my three-year anniversary. Um, and I, I wanted to live in Europe. I had been thinking about a transition to Europe for a while, and um, I had thought about several cities, uh, had explored a few options, including Zurich and Barcelona, um, and ultimately found Amsterdam was the right fit for me, um, not only for visa-wise, but just culturally, and um, its location to its proximity to other countries that I wanted to spend time in, long weekends, et cetera, just kind of learning about the world. So living in Europe is, is incredible as a base camp if you're interested in traveling and, and seeing things. And I'm sort of a curious George, I have a really strong curious George personality. Um, and so living in Southern California, flying to Europe is a much bigger task and seeing parts of the world that I find interesting is a much bigger task um, with a nine hour time difference and a 12 to 15 hour flight. So Living in the middle of, of the world as I see it is, is hugely beneficial. Um, and every day just I learn so much and I'm kind of in the middle of the international community and um, it's been a great experience. So I still go back yeah. and visit, but I'm happy to be in Europe. So you run a fund that you started running when you were in California. What was your answer both to yourself and to other people when they said, oh, how can you go about doing investment research from Amsterdam or any yeah. other city in Europe for that matter, especially when I think we can agree that you're an Anglophone investor? Yes. Yeah, primarily a North America-focused fund. Um, it's been, I, at first, it, I wasn't totally sure, but I had spent time in Europe, um, of course, coming to ValueX, uh, to your event in Switzerland, and then just thinking about moving to Europe for a year or two before it actually happened. And um, yeah, I found it's nice. The market doesn't open until 3.30. Um, I didn't realize what a distraction it was uh, in California, Southern California. You know, the market opens at 6.30 in the morning. And so there was always this tendency to wake up early and really try hard not to focus on the market, but you still do. It's still in the background. And so the market not opening at 3.30 allows you to really feel and, and nobody's calling you from from the US either and emailing you so it's really a quiet time for me um, to get up at a normal time and go to the office and think and read and research and as far as primary research is concerned um, I my, my research process has a lot to do with you know reading um, and interviewing people that were that work for you know that work for in and around the company. And I don't do too many uh, company visits because the technology we today have are with um, um, with primary research tools like Tegas, for example, I can get access to interviews and do the interviews myself with with people in a value chain of a company that is and have a much more powerful walk away with a much more powerful insight than I could jumping on a plane and having a, a two hour meeting with somebody uh, at a CEO or somebody like that. So um, it is, it's been very beneficial for me 
uh, living in Amsterdam, I feel like I actually get more done um, than I did in California. I think that if, if you and I would have gone back 20 or 30 years, people would have said that in order to do this kind of business, you have to be in uh, Manhattan. And then, then people started emerging who are not in Manhattan, mainly Warren Buffett, but other people as well. But uh, I think that most of them would have said that you need to be in the United States. So that's a, I mean, in a certain way, I did it 10 years ago. But I think that where I want to take you to is that I think when I came here 10 years ago, I felt like what I would be doing is reading 10Ks, 10Qs, transcripts. Uh, and I think that the world of how we do investment research has changed very much, even as a result of COVID-19. And perhaps you can share a little bit more about why you don't feel you're at any disadvantage, let's say, to somebody who's maybe in Shenzhen or in San Diego or in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley or in London or, uh, or in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, right. You're right, Guy, that where you live is becoming less important um, for investment research uh, because the ability to gain any kind of advantage, informational advantage, is generally whittled out of investment research. And so what you really have first and foremost is time. Um, but in addition to that, you need to develop a, a thesis, a long-term thesis that matches that, that, that time duration. And so to do that, um, getting access to people in, in an ecosystem of either an industry or, or a company uh, is easier to do with modern tools that allow you to you know, basically pay to interview um, people. So a VP of sales or a supplier or a, a, an ex salesperson or a current salesperson or a disgruntled employee um, or a, a former VP um, with the competition or with you're just in, a, in the sector of, of a company you're interested in researching. Um, and so to get access, so modern technology uh, and companies that produce primary research or even, even if you did it yourself as far as just finding people in LinkedIn or in podcasts, it produces a much, much, much richer, more focused set of people to learn from than you ever could just showing up in a particular office or trying to meet people one on one. It's much more efficient, and of course, that can be done from, that can be done anywhere. So it's definitely a different mindset. But a small fund today can get access. A focused small fund with a few number of positions can produce the same research and have the same insights as a large fund, I believe, um, with, you know, operating, um, operating like that. Jeremy, to help me and perhaps anybody else listening in, can you maybe give a, a, a concrete example of what we're talking about? And I think that, I mean, actually during the lockdown is when I really started experimenting in earnest with using LinkedIn yeah. to generate conversations. And you've also talked about Tegas, but yeah. without solely focusing on Tegas. If, if you think about 50 years ago, Scuttlebutt involved visiting the headquarters and visiting the factory and talking to employees. What does Scuttlebutt look like today for you in a specific example? Well, there's a couple examples. So podcasts um, are a great source of information because um, there are so many specialized, there's people that are really specialized or excited about a sector or a little nuance of a sector. And, and they may just have a podcast where they just chit chat about the, the sector. And sometimes they're not even doing it for money. They're just so passionate about it. Um, and you can find people that have deep, deep industry expertise in something. And they're not necessarily investors. They just know something that, that could translate into a very valuable piece of information. Uh, around a thesis uh, of a company that you're interested in. So as an example, one of the sectors um, I'm really interested in and, and invested around is um, ad, the evolution of ad tech. So uh, and part of our research process on, on, um, on Roku, I was looking for and finding these small podcasts um, around companies that, you know, where, where the host interviews small companies that are doing, uh, that are selling um, digital advertising um, into connected TV and companies or, and, and, and people that were, would kind of talk about the, 
what was happening within and around connected TV in general and ad supported connected TV. And so one of the podcasts I came across with these two guys um, this has this show called The Streaming Wars. And in the podcast, it's just these two guys that have other, they have day jobs and um, they just talk about what's happening in the streaming wars. And so a lot of the, a lot of the show is about content and not necessarily specific to Roku or any of the companies that, that even I was, I was researching at the time, but I could tell after listening to 10 or 12 episodes that they had a real specific sense of of quality and what 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 they they had a sense of what the consumer um, thought and was a read on the consumer um, of the overall industry and the direction of the connected TV industry relative to it was kind of independent and valuable to me much more so than than reading that that perspective or asking that same question within the industry itself. So I emailed them and I said, "Would you mind if I paid you to?" ask you a bunch of questions. And they said yes, and ended up talking for two hours about their view on, on specifically on Roku and the value add of a small content provider putting their channel, their streaming television, their streaming TV channel on Roku and versus YouTube versus other platforms and um, the reach and, and how that's changing. And we also hit on why HBO Max may or not be, may, may, may or may not be uh, going to Roku and what the potential negotiation holdups could be. And it was super, super interesting insight from a couple of people that, that I would never have come across otherwise. And um, so, they, but they took the money off you. Yeah, yeah. Just to be clear. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I think... So they were happy yeah, for the no, money. They were but happy, and I didn't pay them much, but I, I felt what I paid them was a, was a going rate. It was actually the same rate that we pay to do research on Tegas. Um, that we can pay uh, to do primary research on Tegas for an interview. And did you consider reaching out to Tegas and saying, look, I'll do this through you and then everybody else gets to benefit? Or did you think about, you know, uh, an idea that may come up later is uh, that I've been learning about is this idea of learning in public. And a number of people I've been learning from have been encouraging their audience or the people that they talk to to learn in public because when you learn in public, many resources come to you. So yes, uh, this might have been an opportunity to take that interview, make a transcript. Did you consider doing that? Um, no, because these guys weren't considered in this particular case. We've done that with Tigas, but in this particular case, um, they're not really industry. They're not industry people. I mean, they are, but they don't work within the industry. And I wasn't sure um, how available they would be. They would not be familiar with Tegas. They had never spoken to an investment fund before. The The people that, that Tegas normally finds or these these expert networks uh, generally find, they, they go out and bet them. They explain what the program is. They explain they're going to be paid, you know, a few hundred dollars for, um, you know, a couple hour interview by an investment manager and what to, you know, what not to say as far as like confidential information around, um, you know, numbers of the company, et cetera. So this was just, th these were two guys that are really passionate about the streaming wars. And um, we've, I've, I've done this with, with a half, a, at least a half a dozen others um, since then. Um, but Tegas is, uh, the expert networks like Tegas are great if you're going to talk to, try to talk to people that work in, in companies either directly related to what you're, you know, the company that you're working on or the, or the industry. Um, so for example, a sales manager of a competitor or um, a, a lawyer that was part of the negotiation on um, the last Spotify and um, contract with the, with the music labels. That's where Tegas is really good. And, and that information is very valuable as well. And again, not, you know, that the person you're talking to may be based you know, 2000 miles away. And the next person you speak to or read of, read about, you know, an hour later, maybe, maybe 500 miles away. So you, the, the efficiency you gain by, by having access to Tegas and then maybe your own primary channels, um, off the, off the cuff channels is, is very powerful. And just out of curiosity, when you're, when you're doing quote research on podcasts or through podcasts, I know that Apple has told me a couple of times now that you can kind of search through the audio. They must have done voice recognition on every single piece of audio that they carry on their platform. Uh, yeah. 
are you just literally taking search terms and putting them into Apple Podcasts, or is yeah, there something? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, that's that's right. I just kind of search um, search around the, the Spotify podcast universe. Just the Spotify podcast universe. Yeah, or... I do. Yeah, yeah. There's more podcasts on there. I think it's it's a more robust tool and um, than even Apple. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. But I'm sure because that, I thought it's, that it's, it's, it, 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 Apple is a great podcast catalog, but. I think there's more interesting. I mean, and I guess a lot of a lot of podcasts probably publish on both. So, uh, and then, uh, how frequently, if I may ask, are you using LinkedIn, and how are you using LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Um, so, two two research projects ago, there was a question um, around the sales practices of a company and the uniqueness of the sales practices. Uh, it was not a company we ended up investing in, but um, had just kind of started searching the company on LinkedIn and found a list of people that I thought could be helpful to answer some questions around these sales practices. And so I just started emailing. I have a premium subscription and just started emailing them and um, told them, I mean, they can see what I do with my on my LinkedIn profile and say, would you be willing to talk? And uh, and they and three or three or four of them of the fifteen I emailed agreed to talk, um, and that was it was helpful. I, I don't know if it was the very best angle, but it was it was helpful. So yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Let's let's uh, so in your presentation and in other conversations that we've had, you've talked about this idea of survivors and thrivers, yeah, and that kind of leading your investment the way you do investment research. Can you give a sense of how that came up, why that is for you a useful way to look at the world? It's important to have a guidepost and a way of looking at companies that in order to, um, in order to understand when you own them, first of all, if you want to continue owning them, especially when they become fully valued, and also to see if they're a fit with the goals and objectives that you've set out as a firm. So in 2016, we started to look at, people were very afraid of a kind of a second kind of crash. And since, since, I've, since I've been in business, people have been very afraid. Whether it's 2011, people were afraid of the double dip or the Greek financial crisis and the, the, the European sovereign debt crisis. Um, 2015, 16, we're afraid of interest, you know, of, of, I don't even remember. There's so many things that have happened between the last and the last nine years where this caused an unusual amount of fear and anxiety. And so we set out to say, to kind of show people or to look at, you know, what would happen if today was the next peak? Because everybody's been talking about peak valuations and peak prices pretty much since I've been in business, but yet the best companies just continue to compound at an incredible rate. So the idea behind it was to look at companies that if you to look at companies between market cycles and look at companies that you look at the market as if you purchased every company at the absolute peak of the cycle of different of all the major cycles going back 50 years and held on to those companies to the next peak. So you had no advantage of price and no advantage of, of timing the market. What kind of companies outperformed by how much and what were those companies like? And inversely, the companies that underperformed, underperformed the most, and what were the characteristics of those companies? And it was a fascinating study because we saw that um, there was, you know, the top 20% of companies in the last peak, which was October 8th, 2007, through I guess what is now, um, what would what, what now would have been around February or so, 2020, but at the time we wrapped it up in October uh, 2019. So. During that period, the companies that outperformed were not necessarily all tech, but they had outperformed by enormous, you know, by more than twice the S and P. And um, inversely, the bottom had underperformed by I think the bottom ten percent underperformed by something lost like sixty seven percent over that whole over that whole period. And so, we wanted to find a thread to stitch stitch them all together and find a framework to look for those companies that we had the, the a way to. We wanted to make sure that the companies that we were owning. And the, and the companies we were going to be adding capital to, of new capital coming in the fund, that we had the conviction to own them, A, if they seemed fully valued, um, because we, we wanted to make sure that we had the conviction to own them also if, if this was a peak. 
and at any given point. Um, so that meant having a stronger fundamental perspective on the future of those businesses and how they would look in the next five years or 10 years versus how they had looked in the past. And what about those companies um, would allow them to not only survive any kind of future turmoil, but thrive and at least keep up with the, with the S&P 500, which is our index. So we looked at lots of different companies, um, dozens and dozens of companies at the top and the bottom um, over five, five major cycles. So published the peak to peak, the last peak to peak analysis on our website, um, JDP cap forward slash peak to peak. And it's interesting to see that the, at the, the top and the bottom companies don't seem to have a lot of things in common. They vary very widely in sector and market cap, but digging a little deeper and starting to read about each company, you, you will see commonalities among them. And so looking at those, comparing them to the companies that underperformed, started to build a framework around how to look at a company and developed four summary characteristics, so to speak, of what every business that we invest in has to have when we buy it and then has to, we focus on watching to make sure that that business is maintaining those characteristics so we can be confident that we want to own it regardless of what's happening in the broader market. And so, I, you know, um, for those people who are listening while they're on a run or a, in a car ride, uh, can you just give the kind of major takeaways from that study? I mean, we'll make sure that there's a link to yeah, the study. Yeah, sure. There's, there's four characteristics um, that, we, that we, we kind of summarized it. Um, so the first is a business model that is adaptable and relevant in tomorrow's economy. The second one is a durable pricing power that is protected by a growing competitive advantage. Third one is capital allocation and balance sheet strategy that supports the company's moat. And the fourth one is a significant alignment of interest between management and equity holders. So um, it's just a guidepost for us to think about how a company is evolving. And the more that a company moves away from any of those four, the less likely it is to even keep up with the S&P. And the companies that really underperformed uh, lack generally all four of those. Did you, how many, how far back did you go with this study, Jeremy? Well, we actually went back to the Great Depression, but the, a lot of the companies that were either up or down at that time aren't around anymore, and so it was less significant. You can't do, it was more difficult to, to, to do the company research, so I would say the last 40 years, the last 40 years gives you a better perspective because a lot of the companies you either know of or have heard of. And, and so they were at the time, they had essentially what amounts to competitive advantages that allowed them, that protected them, that protected their growth um, over, over, you know, over a long period of time that allowed them to grow. But every company tends to have, you know, every company has its ceiling. And so if you go back too far, you're not going to really see any companies. I mean, the original companies in the in the Dow are pretty much non-existent. I think GE or something is still there, but it's not in the same form that it was originally. So if you go put back too far, um, you can't necessarily quantify this. You can't you can't point to individual companies that have survived and thrived forever because every company has a has a has its um, has its time, um, and that lifespan is is getting shorter as time goes on. So what's important is to make sure that you've got a framework for looking at companies that are, that are going to be around, they're going to survive and thrive over the next, you know, period of time that, that matched with what you're investing. And there's people that have done this much, much better than us. And, um, um, but I, <laughs> it, it works for us and it, it's, yeah. it sounds simplistic, but, um, it is, it's a kind of a way that we, we think about things, when you say there are people who've done it better than us, that means you, you see. Well, well I, I guess we could get, you know, we could get into this, but um, one of the I think the the person who's really done it the best is Hamilton Hilmer and uh, his Seven Powers, um, who who I discovered after um, coming up with our own. Yeah. Um, tell tell the story about how you came to him. How did you find him? 
Um, I read an article about the seven powers and then um, I thought it was interesting, but I, I didn't process it um, probably as fully as I should have. And then more recently, he was interviewed uh, on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast, Invest, uh, Invest Like the Best. And it caused me to revisit the original article and the summary about the seven powers. And I instantly just kind of downloaded the book and read it and um, realized that Hamilton had come, you know, he's next level thinking for sure, that he had spent his career trying to find a way to make sure that he had what we would call, a traditional value investors would call a margin of safety um, in order to maximize his return of potential compounding of a company. And that using traditional accounting financial models and accounting matrix about past numbers was far from good enough that you're never going to be able to understand and handicap the future of a business by just looking at past accounting statements. And so uh, he's a, a very famous and, and one of the best strategy thinkers that I've ever run across, um, at least his ability to communicate it. I believe he's a professor at Stanford, a strategy professor at Stanford, and has a very successful um, hedge fund as well, mostly tech-focused, concentrated. He developed you know, what he calls his seven powers, which are the pow powers that a company has to have to what I would say survive and thrive for, for a long period of time. And that framework is what is strategic thinking that allows him to have an edge um, on companies that are often very, very public and they're large and they're liquid and everybody may know about them, but allows him to think about them differently and um, get a sense for if he believes that they're going to, you know, be winners or losers over his time horizon. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the key takeaways, and I really appreciate you, you're sending me that book and for your interest or for the listener's interest, that was the first time I tried out doing a uh, thread on Twitter or a tweet storm, if you like. And so I took my summary of that book written over two or three hours, I didn't take much longer over it, and tweeted it all out. And you should know, Jeremy, that as a result of that, I got, I mean, one of the, one of the aspects uh, of the seven powers I actually didn't fully understand and I got wrong. But on all of the seven powers, and it was about 10 or 12 tweets that I did, I got some fantastic feedback and uh, resources and ended up reconnecting with a friend at Google, for example, that has led to other learning, so I'm deeply appreciative of it, and it's a fantastic book. And the uh, hedge fund that he has is called Strategy Capital. Oh uh, yes, yes. I suspect that the returns are off the charts extraordinary. Yeah. The intro the introduction is by the CEO of Netflix, whose name has just dropped out of my head. Reed Hastings. Yes, and. Um, and one of the things that he says is that, you know, you, well, strategy is not static, it's dynamic. These things are unfolding, and actually, that's not well captured in Michael Porter's five force model, which is more of a static way of viewing the world. The only way you get the dynamic picture in the five forces view of the world is through the kind of rivalry between the competitors tries to capture it. Yes. But he also says that. There are key moments, all, all um, increases in power of a corporation come from innovation at key moments or entrepreneurship from the organization at key moments. Right. In any case, it's a fantastic book. It's just that I, I guess you can't look at a, it's, it's seeing a Netflix take, uh, you know, for example, decide that it was effectively going to kill its DVD rental business because they knew that everything was going streaming. Seeing that they were doing that and knowing that that was the right decision, even though uh, the market hated it and buying the shares at that point. I guess the question that I have for you, which is not 100% related to what I just said, but is on the mind of every value investor, is that what do you do when you've lived in a world where you're kind of finding companies that are at some kind of cheap multiple of something and we all agree that at the end of the day the value of the business is the discounted value of the cash flows that you can take out of the business 
But the kind of analysis that Hamilton Helmer is doing, the kind of analysis that you would have had to, or you have to do to own any one of the companies that uh, you mention or other people mention, require you to basically invest at something that is at a very, very high multiple of revenues uh, and that is not apparently making any money at all. And so you have to kind of, it seems to me, have a, that doesn't square very well with somebody who's doing discounted cash flows or doing multiples of some kind of measure of earnings. It's a expectation that this business will continue to evolve so well for so long that sometime in the future, quite a few years from now, it's going to gush cash. And I guess the example for me is Amazon. Ten years ago, I actually genuinely believed that it might be the only company ever known that had spent its whole life cycle investing in delivering value for the customer and never sending anything back to the shareholders. Mm. That's been proven very, very strongly wrong because the company is enormously cash generative right now. But how does one invest in a Netflix that is spending all of its money, for example, on acquiring new content, or in any other company that is doesn't appear to be making any money? How is that? Yeah. How can one put a value perspe- value investing perspective onto that? Well, and, and Hamilton talks about this in the in the interview with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and, and we try to address it. We have our own way of thinking that the survivors and thriver criteria. Like I said, um, so yeah, just because something is a sort of quote unquote tech business doesn't necessarily mean that you can figure it out or that it, it is worth what the whatever multiple on whatever the market is giving it is worth that. But um, just like anything, I think it's starting with a, a circle of competence. So starting somewhere um, and being interested in expanding and rapidly expanding your circle of competence because if your competition is the S&P 500 and we know that the top 50 companies in the S&P 500 since since the beginning of the S&P 500 have dominated the returns so more than half of the returns come from the top 50 companies so if the S&P is your is your competition then you need to look at okay the best companies in the world are sitting in the S&P 500 at the top so instead of looking at the valuation of those companies I think it's smart to say, or it's a good idea to say, what is happening with those companies and what is happening around those companies and what is happening in the world today that affects those companies that's going to be either be positive or negative for those companies. And when you do that, you it, it, you quickly see that the world has shifted very rapidly from kind of a an analog to a digital economy. And the crisis we're in now with COVID has accelerated that. So as a starting point, um, I think it's important to think to, to, to think about the, the world in terms of what is the future going to look like more than the past. And we say that in investing, that the past, you know, there's that always that, that funny legal statement that before you listen to anybody talk about investing, they say the past is not represent of, representative of the future. But in that, you know, at least um, when I started investing, um, we, we depended on 100% of looking at the past and the past numbers and somehow extrapolating that out into the future and thinking in terms of, well, you know, for the last 50 years, it's produced this return on invested capital and, and this kind of growth and 3% a year GDP plus 2 or 3%. So we're just going to handicap that and just to, there's an 80% chance that'll happen and discount that back today. And this is the value of the company. But in a, in a digital world where capital and where value is created with, without traditional and without the need for, for hard assets or, or so much value can be created with small, much smaller amounts of money, and the value cannot always be put on a balance sheet. It's it's intangible. You have to start by saying, okay, well, you know, three three guys and girls sitting in a room can have a great idea and start coding and potentially develop something that's worth, you know, hundreds of millions um, within a very short period of time. There is that potential. Um, if I said to you, well, somebody's captured the value of the English language and they put it into a box. And you can, it's for sale. Well, how much would you pay for that? Well, you know, it's not worth, you know, and it had never been captured before. How much would you pay for that? Well, you would know that it's not worth zero just because it doesn't have a track record. 
doesn't mean that it's not worth zero, but you can sort of come to some conclusion that the value of the English language is worth more than zero, even if you could harness some of its value. So coming, it was a challenge for me also, um, you know, years ago to start thinking about business in terms of trying to understand the future of a business much more so than the past. And um, I, when the S and P, you know, became, you know, dominated by by these incredible tech businesses, it forced me to start studying them and looking at them and saying, okay, I get it. Value is not sitting on a balance sheet. Value is not tangible, and neither is is margin of safety. So there's not a margin of safety in these in these kind of hard assets anymore, especially in an economy that's shrinking, and we'll probably be experiencing deflation for a long time as a result of. The, the, the shift to technology and the cost being taken out of, of the system. So I guess to come back to to your your original question, it's it's the first it, first is to kind of get at least our journey um, has been to become really interested in a particular sector and just start reading extensively about it and talking with people about it and, and develop a sense for where something is evolving towards. And I like companies where I can see that they're growing at the expense, at, at minimum, uh, at the expense of others. And that as a result of that, the, their addressable market is also expanding and they have a clear competitive advantage in that. But like Hamilton also talks about in the seven powers is um, it's a journey. You're not going to necessarily know out of the gate that you're, you've got the next, you know, necessarily Netflix or Google in your hands. And I don't think it's about that. It's not about saying like, What's the probability that this billion billion dollar market cap company is going to be a hundred hundred billion? I mean, that's that that's great if that happens, but I don't think that that's exactly what it is. They're not all moonshots. Um, it's developing a perspective on does this company have what it takes, or is it is it continuing to evolve its competitive advantage? And in Hamilton's words, it's it's power, it's business power, to to have a shot at developing a, a, a barrier around it to protect its future earnings. And so a lot of it is just, it's continuation of analysis, but not just waiting for the quarterly earnings to come out analysis. That, that is part of it as well. But um, analysis around watching the evolution of a business's uh, ability to, to grow its competitive advantage and, and put up those barriers that will allow it um, to continue to grow uh, without without being displaced by, by incumbents. Well, let, let's just uh, get in a little bit. If you don't mind, I'm going to give you all the reasons why that is so extraordinarily hard. So uh, many company managements are highly promotional. So, and not just are they, not, they're not just highly promotional, uh, they are salespeople. And obviously they believe in the business that they're in. They've committed their you know, perhaps not perhaps their lifetime, but a significant portion of their career to it. And so they are believers. And so uh, there's no doubt for me that I find a very, have a very hard time trying to piece through, you know, the, the ability to distinguish between a Reed Hastings, who I don't think is promotional, and maybe one or two managers who are promotional, uh, who um, start believing their own, it's not fair to say lies, but their own promotions and actually getting to the reality. I can give you two companies that, uh, you know, anybody who emails me privately, I can give the names, I just don't want to say it publicly, where I've spoken to investors and to people at the company who believe that they have the most phenomenal business, but I felt through doing or believed through doing Scuttlebutt that the story that they were telling the public was very, very different to the reality. Yeah. And then you have something else, which is that when you're talking about the new economy, a huge proportion of those companies, not all of them, but many of them are coming out of Silicon Valley and venture capital circles. So there are people who know a lot more about those companies who are way smarter or have very high IQs. Uh, and many of those companies never go public or aren't going public. Right. So if you right. talk about Airbnb or Uber that's right. or you know, a company that's come across my radar a few times now is uh, Stripe. Palantir, I would love to yeah, learn. 23andMe. Yeah. Yeah. And some incredible companies that aren't, aren't going public. And a lot of the value is being uh, earned by the private 
by the private holders. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it's actually an example of the perversity of regulation because in the aftermath of 1999-2000, they brought Sarbanes-Oxley, which is supposed to protect the investor. And what it did was it just drove people away from the capital markets and means that so many of these companies are not public. But you're actually looking for that company where the reality matches the perception or is better than the perception. Let's face it, the perception for some of these companies is extraordinarily rosy. I mean, I looked at a company, uh, well, I can say the name of it, Trulia, Mm -hmm. which is involved in unbundling telecom services and connecting them to software. And I realized that they're part of the infrastructure of the new economy. But I certainly have a hard time working out how any company can be worth 35 times revenues. Yeah. And I asked myself, well, if they're the sum of the cash flows that you take out of the business, how, how, so how do you sort through that morass? Yeah. And you know, in, in, a world, in a world where you don't know who the patsy is, you may well be the patsy. And I'm pretty sure that the CEOs are not patsies. I'm pretty sure that the venture capitalists are not patsies. You know, it's quite possible that the guy whose shares I'm buying is not a patsy. So, you know, how do you assure yourself when you get into some of these businesses that are winning at the expense of somebody else? How do you know that you're not the patsy? Yeah. Well, I think I would start by inverting that question and saying, how do you know when you look at a company of yesterday that's melting, a melting ice cube company that's large, let's take like General Motors, for example, that trades for a single digit multiple of presumed earnings. Um, There's this assumption that that is somehow a margin of safety and that the downside is limited. And so whether it's you're talking about uh, CBS Viacom or Discovery or any of these kind of low PE companies that are that are trading that way, the market is very fairly probably they're probably overvaluing a lot of those companies. Um, For what looks like four or five times earning is probably 50 times earnings. Um, And so if you if you look, it, it, I guess it comes down to figuring out what your own margin of safety is and what your goals are. Because margin of safety is much less so in the past today than it ever was. Because companies are changing very, very rapidly. Um, the idea of having to, uh, you know, the, the, the companies are able to use, so even old economy companies that embrace technology or embrace change have an enormous advantage over the ones that don't. Um, and so technology is offering an, an incredible opportunity to some old economy companies and then others that are not evolving or can't evolve, as Hamilton Helmer talked about in, in counter-positioning, um, because doing so would mean burning their own business. I would argue that those are, are even more risky and more unsafe to just be long a handful of sort of dying businesses that seem to look cheap and finding uh, an, you know, comfort in the same place that everybody else finds comfort. Um, so that would be first. Secondly, and, and, and not necessarily that you, know, you have to just go pay anything for any company that's growing. Um, there's probably on the reverse and, and the flip side, there's probably some companies that screen cheap today that really are truly undervalued. Um, and I definitely there are. And that offer an incredible risk re- risk reward, and you should own. But a lot of the companies that are trading cheap right now really are cheap for a reason, and they're probably more dangerous than than a lot of the large companies that seem to be trading um, at a rich valuation relative to historical kind of financial accounting. Um, so it's really about valuing the coming up with an opinion on the business and looking at where the business is going to go tomorrow where the sector is where where you believe it's positioned and you can't come to that conclusion without a really in-depth knowledge and research and fascination with the sector um the players in that sector and having kind of a, a really a really good understanding of, of the ecosystem that that company's playing in and where it's going to be in the next, where it could be in the next two, three, five, and 10 years. And, mm-hmm. and not necessarily, so, so it's, it's not about financial research as much as it is trying to understand where a business is going and where a sector is going and where everybody is going. 
And it does sound kind of venture capital-esque to, to say that, but the biggest mistakes I've made in my career over the last decade or so investing have been selling companies because they screened fully valued on paper, but completely missing what was actually happening or going to happen in the next two or three or five years. And it wasn't difficult to figure out. It's just I, my mind wasn't there. My, my head wasn't there. I was thinking more about that. I, that I thought I was doing my investors a, a service by being diligent and being safe and risk adverse by selling incredible businesses that had gone up to what I in my I imagined was full value, but then they went on to compound at, you know, five, six X more over the next, you know, five or 10 years. And, um, and we all lost out because of that mindset. So um, it's just a shift around thinking about the future of a business and having that kind of business owner mindset. You wouldn't buy a whole business unless you had a really strong view on where that business was going to be in the next five or 10 years. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's just going to be doing the same thing it was doing five years ago. Um, because that's just not the, that's just not the way modern business works. The wo world is moving too quickly and to buy a business betting that it's going to be stagnant uh, as a passive investor is a losing proposition. Because if you can control the free cash flow that's coming out of a stagnant business, so if you bought C's Candy today, I mean, it made sense for Buffett to buy it because he can take, take out that cash and re reinvest it in other things. Or if you were running a private equity fund and you could re-lever that business or suck out the cash every month and distribute it and get paid on an IRR formula, which is internal rate of return and not total return, then, then it would be great. But if you would have bought C's Candy as a passive investor and it was a publicly traded business and it just sat there and it, and just, and it just dividended out the cash, some of the cash, let's say every quarter or every year or potentially none of the cash, and it just sat there and built up and built up, there'd be this nice little run for a while. But then over time, there's no way that, that the total return could outperform the best companies in the world, which in my case would be the, the S&P, you know, the companies in the S&P 500. So it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're a passive investor um, looking, I think, you know, investing in, in modern businesses and trying to benchmark against the S&P 500, which have the best companies in the world in it, 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 it I think it's important to come up with a framework um, other than just looking at past financial statements. And that's going to be very, uh, very company specific. Jeremy, um, maybe you'd be willing to share some of the companies that you sold way too early, just out of curiosity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, some of, so some of the large caps, um, some of the large cap names now that are that are now sort of somewhat famous. Um, but yeah, I don't remember them all. I, I, I'd rather not uh, share. I, I don't, <laughs> no problem. Uh, and and I have so, to, you kind of caught me off guard. I actually did this for two of my largest investors. I did this. Uh, actually, I might be able to look it up if you if you wait. Um, I, I actually made a list for my the largest two investors of, of every investment we had made and, and showed them um, the mistakes and how we've evolved over time. And the biggest mistakes were the mistakes of admission and looked at the companies that we sold compared to where they are today. And most of them, the ones that actually stayed in business and weren't acquired, had gone on to compound mm -hmm. at, at, at very high rates. Um, and it's unfortunate but that we sold out. But Jeremy, if you do, if they don't come straight to mind, that's just not painful enough for even us even to bring up. Yeah, their, no, no, their... They, yeah, they weren't. Um, you know, they weren't. There were not but, any hundred baggers in there. So, but just just so, life would have been a lot lot easier on us um, from an operational perspective, from risk perspective, and from a tax perspective if we had just probably held on to the first yeah. few investments that I ever made. So uh, we're coming to up to close to the end of an hour. Um, can you, you? I know that you're researching ad tech. Yes. Uh, are there are there any other sectors that you care to mention here that you're investigating that perhaps you'd like to hear from a listener if they happen to feel like they have any special insights? What in addition to ad tech is interesting to you? Well, right now ad tech is is really a focus because within ad tech there are so many sub sub sectors um, and sub businesses within within ad tech so initially um, ad tech really was google 
Um, so you had traditional media spend about 390 billion, um, uh, more or less a year in the U.S. And at I think last year was the first year that ad tech became about half of that, and most of it historically went to Google. I mean, Google sort of invented ad tech, and then Facebook. Um, and so now we have today we have companies that are have figured out how to take a highly specialized niche of whatever they do and create their own platform and their own ecosystem for advertising and produce very, very high rates of return for, for the advertiser because the, the consumer is so focused on an area. It's an area of, of a consumer's life where they're even more focused and have maybe something on their mind other than with traditionally the only, you know, than, than maybe social media or just, just traditional search. So within ad tech, um, what's interesting is to see um, companies like Spotify reinventing the podcast business, the podcast industry, because you know during a podcast uh, is a time when people are the most engaged, and so there's an opportunity for 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 Spotify to build a ad tech platform to serve highly highly targeted advertisements inside of those podcasts, regardless if you're a premium member or not. And the returns on on that one ad can be enormous, and they they also have a way of of, of following you and 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 kind of making sure that you following up to see how you um, if you actually engage and if you bought the product or not. And then there's other set of other industries which which some people consider totally different, but I'm still thinking in terms of ad tech with like connected TV. So Roku is one of our largest positions. And um, Roku, you know, the last decade was the decade of, 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 of um, subscription-supported streaming. And our thesis is this decade will be the decade of advertising-supported streaming. So um, as the traditional media companies have to move online to, to, to streaming, uh, companies like Roku are set to benefit from creating maybe Instagram like highly targeted advert advertisements that get put into um, your reruns of MASH or reality show or just kind of mindless TV that makes up a majority of actually what people watch on TV. And so it makes the ad experience much more valuable and more and, and higher quality for the consumer. And then lastly, there's there's companies uh, like Cardlytics um, that are able to see that are able to reach in and see your spending the spending data inside of of your credit card and debit cards and serve you ads within your your bank ad or your banking app um, with discounts um, on for online purchases. So these are forms of of advertising and advertising tech that one are are going to benefit from um, the declining traditional advertising revenue and media and then. Also, just sectors get little little niches getting better at what they do, um, and being able to serve a very very high quality ad that wasn't available before, that probably has you know potentially better or in some cases much better um, ROI for the for the advertiser than the the, the, the you know the, the you know, like a Facebook or or Google in some cases. That's all. You know, Lee, no time for the questions that I have, but I'm going to state them and you don't have to get into them. But uh, uh, it, it, podcasting, when you look at the explosion and the number of hours, I, somewhere I read that the ability to generate revenue off those podcasts has been very limited. I probably haven't read enough of my Ben Thompson stratechery on yeah. the subject, but for what it's worth, I, I find it highly intrusive when... Um, when I hear some kind of interruption ad, even if it's by the host of the program. And, and having said that, I've become a huge fan of all subscription, media subscription businesses as a personal consumer. And I, I pay a lot in terms of subscription in order to make sure that I don't get served ads. By contrast, it seems to me that uh, the, the ability to see discounts on your bank statement and then to uh, adjust your activity capture those discounts uh, because they, they come directly related to your spending as, a, as an enormously productive place to look. And it's, I, I, it reminds me that I want to take another look at that. Let's move on to, I guess it's, it's uh, two last questions I want to give you that for the listeners benefit. 
I have not prepared Jeremy for, but I know that you've talked about your admiration for Anthony Wood, uh, yes. the CEO of Roku. Uh, are there any other CEOs, ideally of publicly traded companies, but don't have to be, uh, they don't have to be in your portfolio or anything, but just people that you admire that, you know, are not, maybe, you know, many people admire Warren Buffett and Jamie yeah. Dimon and Reed Hastings, but people that are worth following that you'd be happy to talk about or just mention. And just so that your mind gets prepared, yeah. I'm really curious after that to hear from you uh, any books in addition to the Helmer book or mm. uh, podcasts or uh, newsletters that mm -hmm. you're enjoying that you feel you're so grateful to the producers or the writers that you want to share them here so that they get more listeners or readers or and for the for the listeners interest Jeremy's now got a look at his face yeah, where he's so kind I just of figuring to out see, um, companies that that have CEO, you know CEOs that I admire so most of the cult holdings in our portfolio are founder led or or somehow uh, run by you know people that were either a co-founder or came in right right after a co-founder right after the company was founded so um Daniel Street from from Stone Co. is somebody that I have not met, but somebody I'd like to meet. Um, an incredible entrepreneur, so the founder of Stone, uh, another holding, um, and he founded it with with somebody that I guess that's a little more off the radar, Eduardo Pontes. Of course, Daniel Eck from Spotify, and you know these are some of the larger larger companies um, that that we own that I where I really respect the the founder. But sometimes I, I think I don't necessarily have a, a huge connection with the founder as far as I feel like they're just this godsend. Um, you know, Andy Wood from from Roku, you know, what, what makes somebody like him special is he made a commitment to building a business that he didn't have to sell because he was already wealthy and it was more of a passion project and he had a lot of twists and turns to get where he, he is today. And it was really a company born inside of, of Netflix initially, even they shared the same office and everything and then spun out with Reed Hastings blessing. Um, um, but I, I think a lot of times to get a great return and to see, you know, to have a company fulfill to, to hit to its full potential, you don't always necessarily have to have a CEO that is just so incredible. You don't always going to get a Daniel Eck. You just need somebody that's good enough to run the business, to compete. Um, that's a thinker. That's 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 willing and able to to go against the grain and reinvest for the long term. Reinvest owner cash flow for the long term. Um, you know, for three, five, and ten years, and not be you know not be settled down by short term need, short term demands of holders. Um, and then just has a vision and is willing to be flexible. And and change and and you know change as they go as the as the world evolves, um, and so it's easier said than done. There's not a lot. Most CEOs don't fit that actually. Most CEOs um, are you know came up through, through the ranks or they have other agendas or they're more short term oriented. They just want to get a payout. You know, there's a lot of good CEOs that are did or that people haven't heard of and maybe they would not be successful running another company uh, maybe they would not be as successful running another company I don't know if you put Daniel Eck in charge of a, a, a cement factory if yeah he'd be somewhat successful it wouldn't be terrible at it but it probably wouldn't wouldn't play to his core competencies so finding that match where where you have a founder type of CEO who who you feel like the competency here the his or her uh, talents and and passion is matched with the company is um is it so yeah i don't i don't necessarily have a long list of people because no that's fine to share so now uh somebody somebody um somebody's listening to this and wants to get into your world so to speak what should they be reading i mean hamilton helmer's book obviously where else should they be going? You you mentioned a podcast earlier. Yeah, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's where, where podcast. Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast, Invest Like the Best, is probably one of the best podcasts. Um, definitely the best podcast that I listen to on a regular basis, and I very much look forward to every episode. It's it's fascinating the people, the quality of interviewers that are inter people that he that he interviews. So. Um, 
So most of the podcasts I listen to are really industry specific and is part of a, a research project, not necessarily yeah. for pleasure. So if I'm researching, you know, something like a particular type of software or, or I don't know, just um, something happening in, in, for example, I was just talking about ad tech. I have a list of com- a list of podcasts that are probably irrelevant to most of the listeners because they're really, really specialized. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, uh, don't assume that because there is the long tail and you're assuming that it's the mainstream that's listening to this. Yeah. But as they listen through, you'll get some guy who's an expert in ad tech. Yeah. So yeah, what sure. are those? I'd love to. Uh, here, let me, uh, I'll tell you the last, the last ones I listened to in my list. I listened to Ad Exchanger, um, which I thought was really interesting. I listened to The Streaming Wars. Um and I listened to in the last few days. Oh, I listened to there's a gold, there's an exchange at Goldman Sachs podcast um, from about a year ago that talks about um, that talks about ad tech. And I listened to let's see before that. Uh, I listened to A16, which is the the Dreesen Horowitz podcast. Uh, um, there's a there's an episode about eight months ago or so that that talks about. Roku and, and ad tech that, that I enjoyed. So that was, those are things I've listened to in the last uh, couple of weeks. And then of course, invest like the best. So, but I think that a key thing for another me, another one I think is interesting. Just, you know, say again, Rico decode, just with Karen yeah. Twister. I, I think any, anytime you've got a, a colorful interviewer that can, that can look, can talk to a founder and, and, and get him, get he or her to talk about, the, the non-traditional parts of the business and their life and the way they're thinking is very, very valuable. Yeah, I, I think that a, a key theme for me is that the, the nature of change is so great that the, um, the, the people that I would have expected to be my sources and curators of new knowledge, which would have been the traditional media outlets, I would have been counting on the Wall Street Journal, MIT Technology Journal, even, but also all the other mainstream press, I would have been expecting them. I mean, there's, there's this columnist, Walker, Walter Mosker, Mossberg, and I remember that 20 years ago, you'd read Walter Mossberg in the Wall Street Journal to find out what was going on in the tech world. Uh, that's no longer the case. You have to go to these uh, long tail sources, but they're available. I guess you have an idea on Spotify, so somebody could actually find you on Spotify and find you find what you've been listening to, because that's available if you allow the public to see yeah. what you're listening to. But yeah. so, lastly, if somebody wants to find out more about you or connect to you, what is the best way to do it? Just, uh, JDPcap.com. So um, you know, JDPcap.com, and they can follow. Or they can put their information on their on our website to sign up to receive our updates. So we do a quarterly performance update and a half year and an annual letter. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. LinkedIn, Jeremy Deal, and, and Twitter is um, at, at Jeremy Deal. Oh. Jeremy, it's been uh, great fun talking to you. Yeah, and, you too. Uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the chat and I'm um, looking forward yeah. to seeing you in Zurich. Uh, for the for the listeners' interest, uh, behind me is a portrait of Warren Buffett, shot by my friend uh, Gillian Segal, and behind you is a portrait of somebody in armor. Uh, <laughs> do you have any idea who that is? It's one of the the people that I think lived in this castle. Um, this tower that I'm in um, is one of the original structures, and it's it's. No, I don't know who it is, but there are six other portraits of. Um, kind of old, overweight white guys um, in armor. So I'm assuming they played a role in defending the castle or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, it's, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for coming and joining me okay. here on this podcast. Thanks, Guy. Have a good rest of your day.